Welcome. In this age of metadata and terrorism, today we devote the full hour of our program to the tug of war between privacy and security. This tension was increased immeasurably in 2013 by Edward Snowden, the computer analyst who revealed the NSA's worldwide surveillance network. Maybe you've seen the film, Citizen Four, the film that just won the Best Documentary Oscar. It was filmed in Hong Kong as Snowden was first leaking documents and meeting with journalists. The world had not yet learned his identity. What's the next step? When do you think you'll go public? Or... Uh, I, th I think it's pretty soon. I mean, with the reaction, this escalated more quickly. I think pretty much as soon as they start trying to make this uh, about me, which should be any day now, yeah. um, I'll, I'll come out just to go, hey, you know, this is, uh, this is not a question of somebody skulking around in the shadows. Yeah. These are public issues. These are not my issues. You know, these are everybody's issues. And I'm not afraid of you. You know, you're not going to bully me into silence like you've done to everybody else. Uh, and if nobody else is going to do it, I will. And hopefully when I'm gone, whatever you do to me, there will be somebody else who will do the same thing. It will be the sort of internet principle of the hydra. You know, you can stomp one person, but there's going to be seven more of us. Yeah. Uh, are you getting more nervous? Um, <laughs> I mean... No, I, I, think, uh, I think the way I look at stress, particularly because I sort of knew this was coming, you know, because I sort of volunteered to walk into it, um, I, I'm already sort of familiar with the idea. I'm not worried about it. When somebody, like, busts in the door, suddenly I'll get nervous and it'll affect yeah, me. But until yeah. they do, uh, uh, I'm... I'm whether we see Snowden as a hero or a traitor or something in between, we must grapple with the questions that he raised. How much surveillance should we allow our government to gather in the name of national security? Since 9-11, the NSA has taken in records from hundreds of billions of domestic phone calls. Have there been effective reforms in the past two years since Snowden came out? Has all the surveillance actually prevented any terrorist acts? We'll delve into that last question as well as the use of domestic drones a bit later. But let's begin our exploration at the Ford Foundation headquarters here in Manhattan. On February 11th, the foundation hosted a conference called Net Gain, working together for a stronger digital society. One panel, which I moderated, included Edward Snowden's lawyer from the ACLU, Ben Wisner, and filmmaker Laura Poitras, who made Citizen Four. She first addressed the danger of losing our freedoms to data collection. From my perspective as a journalist, I mean, one of the things that I'm really committed to do now with the, the attention that is on this issue is, is questions around digital security, particularly not only for journalists, but for people that, that, the, that, that we need to raise awareness of why it really matters if your information can be collected and what are the real world consequences. And I think sometimes when we're in situations where maybe we don't perceive the threat, um, then we, the, the urgency gets lost. But the urgency is very real. I mean, in the U.S., as a journalist, I can say that I will do whatever I can within my power to protect a source. It doesn't help me if the government can turn to Google and get all of my information and find out who I've emailed. So we do need other strategies, and we do need to be aware of this kind of communication and, and the threat that it poses, not just to journalists, but to activists, to lawyers, to human rights workers, and globally. Um, and, uh, and so those were some of the themes that, that came up today, as, as well as many, many others. Ben, I don't know how much of today you've been here for. Do you want to add to that at all? Well, I will say that, that there's no technology that doesn't have um, lots of positive uses and lots of potentially scary uses. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the Internet is um, one of the, per perhaps the greatest forum for free speech that's ever been created. Um, it's also uh, an architected surveillance uh, uh, mechanism unless you have the right kinds of rules. Uh, and I think that what we've learned in the last year and a half is that the technologies have far outpaced democratic controls. Um, and that it wasn't only that our governments were concealing information from us rather than bringing us into a debate that we should have been part of. It's that they were actually blatantly and affirmatively lying to us about what they were doing. I think what the film shows so effectively um, is what those of us who were trying to work through the system faced before Snowden went around the system, 
Um, we tried to bring these issues to courts. We were told it was a state secret. Uh, we tried to raise these issues in Congress. Um, the, the leaders of the intelligence community lied blatantly um, in Congress, and they weren't lying to the members of Congress who knew that the answers were false. They were lying to us, uh, and no one corrected them. Um, and so now uh, we have what we should have had before this worldwide uh, mass surveillance regime was deployed. We have a debate uh, about how we can ensure that we get the benefits um, from these technologies without suffering the harsh consequences. Do you think then, Ben, that what we saw in the film with Clapper and Alexander lately lying like that versus the privacy that you're concerned with, that this idea that transparency and privacy are in conflict with each other, we want transparency, but oh, we also want privacy. And I've heard, you know, References into the, in, the, in the media, you know, I've had this conversation myself uh, uh, about whether, do we want contradictory things? But it, it, in a way, this film makes clear that these are really very different things that don't have to be in conflict. Do you well, see it that way? Well, and it depends way? which way you're pointing the lens. Um, you know, Aristotle said that when the government has secrecy uh, and the people have no privacy, that's tyranny. Uh, when the government is transparent and the people have privacy, that's a republic. Um, so these things are not values in the abstract. It depends on context. Um, we do want powerful institutions to be transparent because we don't want our lives to be shaped by forces that are invisible uh, when we don't have a fair process for objecting. Uh, at the same time, we want individual lives um, to have a zone of privacy so that people can develop, so that um, they can try on identity, so that politics, so that dissidents um, can, can have space to do what they do without being under uh, you know, a constant eye in the sky. So I actually don't think that, that, that there's any inherent conflict between wanting a transparent government uh, and a private space for individuals. And we'll take questions from you all, whoever wants to ask questions in a little while. So, so think of them, because you will get a chance. Uh, but Laura, did you want to add to that at all? Well, I mean, what I would, I would say, I mean, again, echoing back to the conversation this morning, is that there was a, a discussion about the need to, that, that, that these issues that, that Ben's talking about or that were talked about this morning impact all of our lives. I mean, it, these are um, of enormous um, consequence, and there's also a lot of un confusion and uncertainty about what actually um, are the solutions and how to sort of build networks of people to start to think about these solutions. And I think that one of what, what Ben is saying about the, that technology is outpacing um, uh, oversight, I mean, it's the, how to fold in the sort of the knowledge base that exists in the technology community so that, so that good decisions are made. Good decisions are made in government. Good decisions are made by foundations. Good decisions are made by, you know, by by those of us who don't understand these technologies. I mean, literally how they work. And it's, I think it's not a surprise that it's the people who really understand how the technologies work are the most you know, sounding the alarm bells. I mean, you see William Binney just talking about how that these technologies, the, pow the, the amount of power that gets amassed when this kind of surveillance is, is allowed to, um, to, this kind of information is allowed to be collected. Yeah, but there was some applause in the audience at that moment in the film that referred to the internet being like a multi-headed hydra, so they couldn't stop these revelations um, by stopping one person. And so I wonder if you could talk about that sure. too, because on the one hand it disempowers, on the one hand, on the other hand it empowers dissidents mm -hmm. and individuals. I mean, actually, that quote is saying what he's what he's saying is that. I will come forward. Whatever happens to me, I won't be the I won't be the last person. That other that other people will take a stand when they see things that are wrong, and or there'll be other whistleblowers or other sources who will you know follow no matter what happens to him. And that's the context in which he's saying. And that's actually something that we're seeing. You know, people and I, and I you know. Uh, I don't think that the answer to the world's problems are we need more whistleblowers who have to go and seek political asylum. I mean, obviously, I think that we need to live in, in a society where we actually understand what our government is doing. Ben, do you th feel like the web is a freedom and democracy battleground? Like, they're using it to surveil every keystroke. You're using it, social media, whatever, to fight the power? You know, I think that about almost any technology. Um, let's take something that's very controversial, like drones. Um, we have uh, in the human rights community, mostly negative associations with drones. They, they fly over countries and fire missiles at people, um, uh, or they can be used for surveillance. Um, but imagine if human rights organizations could fly drones with cameras over the South Sudan. 
uh, or in places where relief workers can't get. Imagine if it could be used um, to show corporations dumping pollutants into rivers in places where they can't be used, or to show the police um, beating protesters. Um, th there's no technology um, that isn't a battleground. Uh, and the way that we resolve those battles is through law and through values. Uh, and I think that the, the debate needs to catch up with the practice. I mean, what we had um, both in Silicon Valley and in Fort Meade um, were people with unlimited budgets uh, who were doing what they were doing because they could. Um, in, in Silicon Valley, the idea is, uh, even if we don't know how we're going to make money off of all of this data, we know we will somehow, so let's get as much as we can. In Fort Meade, you know, the, the, the plan was collect it all. The authorities will follow. The budgets will follow. Uh, you had an NSA director who set up his, his headquarters uh, to look like the command deck on the Starship Enterprise. And he would bring in members of Congress and, and, and show them these um, displays. And so uh, that's exactly the wrong way um, for us to be you know, deploying very powerful technologies. Is let's do what we can because we can, and then later on figure out what the rules should be. We need to have a conversation and a debate um, about how we want to constrain um, these powers before we just deploy them. Does the digital playing field advantage one side or over the other? Well, I think you know you were onto something before. Um, it, it advantages both sides in some sense, um, right? I mean, obviously, the side with the most power and resources always has an advantage, uh, and and it would be silly to think that the U.S. intelligence community has a glass jaw um, and all it takes is a whistleblower, a filmmaker, a couple of scrappy lawyers and everything's been turned around. No, I mean they have tens of billions of dollars every year they hire the best engineers and mathematicians. Um, so no, they're, they're, they're here to say at the same time, um, you know, when, when Daniel Ellsberg wanted to copy the Pentagon Papers, um, he needed to, you know, enlist his teenage kids, use a bunch of Xerox machines in a safe house in Santa Monica. Uh, in 1971, when anti-war activists, um, you know, stole FBI files, they had to case an office, break in, use suitcases, and, you know, now it's possible to, um, to liberate this information at the press of a button. Uh, and you saw the effect of Chelsea Manning and when Edward Snowden um, you know, what they were able to do. So I do think that, you know, that there's a way in which technology um, gives everybody more weapons in this fight. But Laura, there's that moment near the end of the film, which in a way was one of the most scary, where William Binney says, oh, you're really going to have to pass documents like they did with people who wrote in Watergate in the basement of a garage. Sure, right, and you have that, and then there's a scene later when Glenn is not, you know, he's communicating by writing, you know, going back to analog, right, going back on pen and paper. Um, yeah, that's really scary. I mean, it's really, I mean, being, doing this kind of journalism right now, it's really hard to do it, um, knowing how the government has been coming down on, on whistleblower sources and, and, and journalists. Who wants to ask a question? Uh, there are a few instances in the film um, where a person said something that, in a way that sounded totally reasonable to the person saying it, but the people in this room might think otherwise. The, the strongest example is the spokesperson for the White House saying Edward Snowden should come to the United States and get a fair trial. And I'm wondering, in instances like this, does the person actually believe what he's saying? Or, like, what, what's the person thinking? Well, I, th I think that, um, you know, we would be wrong to characterize um, the members of the deep state and their spokespeople and defenders um, as nefarious and evil people who are wondering what they can get away with and you know, whispering the actual truths to each other when no one's listening. No, look, I think that they are, for the most part, um, sincere um, in their defense of what they're doing, um, see themselves as constrained by layers and layers of rules, uh, and have sort of um, you know, lost the forest for the trees uh, and, and, and haven't seen that, you know, the problem is not um, uh, that, you know, when they break the rules, the problem is what the rules allow. Um, and, and, and so I don't, I don't actually think that um, these people are, are, are always insincere in those defenses. I might not extend um, this sort of charitable take to people who are professional spinmeisters, like the people who are spokespeople. Um, I don't know whether the people in the White House understand whether the Espionage Act has a public interest defense, whether the government has to show harm from the disclosures, whether they know that the whistleblower has no opportunity to defend himself based on um, um, uh, all the good effects of the leak, um, wh whether they know that basically it's a First Amendment-free trial um, that takes place under the law. I have no idea what they actually know, but I think in general, 
um, the, the, the people who work inside these establishments um, believe in their mission. I've seen the film twice now. At the end, when uh, uh, Glenn writes down the source of the control of the drones is in Germany, not elsewhere, and what a great stir there will cause. And everything else in the film seems to me about surveillance of us. And um, I have opinions about whether drones should be flying and, and killing people. But that seems like a choice more about uh, kind of Julian Assange expose everything rather than expose how we're being surveilled. And I'm interested in uh, your opinion or your uh, 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 informing us as a filmmaker how you chose to include that or not and if it seemed different to you. Yeah, I mean, I can, um, I'd be happy to address that. I mean, I've been based in Germany the last two years and they actually have laws about what, what can happen there in terms of how the military is used and, um, and actually, this is very much public interest in, in, in Germany, and it's actually reporting that's going to be ongoing. But I do think that, that in, in, in a country should know if, an, if another country has military base that's being used for those kinds of programs. I think it's absolutely public interest. Okay, can I add to that? I mean, I, I think that even if you define we, as I think you did, as Americans um, in your question, we um, ought to know, unless it's the most sensitive kind of source or method, um, what our military is doing overseas, um, right? Not only if it's illegal, we should know. We have a right to know. Presumptively, we have a right to know. But I actually think that, that the point of the reporting of the last two years is that we is actually bigger um, than the we in, in your question, and that, and, and that this was not intended to be just a story about the NSA, a single three-letter uh, agency run amok. Um, all of the technologies that the NSA is deploying are going to be available to, to many, many other governments sooner rather than later. Some of them already are. Um, and so this is something where um, um, you know, we're going to need to decide as a global society, um, how do we um, constrain this kind of capability? Much like as a global society, we've had to make that, uh, those kinds of discussions about nuclear proliferation. Maybe not exactly the same, but, but it's not a bad way to think about it. Um, you know, these are technologies that have enormous uh, implications on human rights um, in the wrong hands and even sometimes in the hands of democratic governments, and we need to broaden our frame to think about that. Uh, on a global scale. Let me follow up on that, because I was going to ask a version of that question um, anyway. Uh, Fred Kaplan from Slate reviewed the film and said, if all I knew about Edward Snowden were his portrait in Laura Poitras' documentary, Citizen Four, I'd probably regard him as a conscientious, brave young man, maybe an American hero. But many other documents, which he downloaded at the NSA facility in Hawaii, et cetera, go far beyond exposures of spying on Americans. Um, email and cell phone conversations by Taliban fighters in Pakistan. In Snowden's first interview abroad with the South China Morning Post, he disclosed that the NSA routinely hacks into hundreds of computers in Hong Kong and China. Um, a story by Poitras in the, her new publication with Glenn Greenwald, The Intercept, revealed again based on Snowden's supply documents um, the stuff about operatives in Germany and China. So he concludes, whatever you think about foreign intelligence operations, the NSA's core mission is to intercept communications of foreign governments and agents. He's saying that is their core mission. If Snowden and company wanted to take down an intelligence agency, they should say so, but that has nothing to do with whistleblowing or constitutional rights, in Fred Kaplan's opinion. I'll give you each a shot at that. But I, 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 then, I, uh, um you know, Fred Kaplan and I do not see eye to eye um, on, on this issue. Um, and I actually, I, th I think that, that he has um, misunderstood a number of things about the reporting. First of all, he's misunderstood the structure of the reporting, um, that every decision about what to publish has been made by journalists at The Guardian, at The Intercept, at The Washington Post, at The New York Times, and other places. That if Snowden had wanted to publish these documents, he could have done so uh, with a keystroke. Um, but instead, um, he used journalists as intermediaries to make public interest decisions. Now, I don't think, so, so two things that I want to say about this, um, and, and then I'll let, let, let Laura, because she's a journalist, um, um, uh, defend her journalism. Um, you know, again, number one, there seems to be this odd idea um, that the only legitimate disclosures um, are those disclosures that show conduct that's illegal under current law. Um, and, and I really, really question that. I think the question has to be something different. 
Um, do the people in a democracy have a right to know and a need to know the information? Uh, and they might have a right to know and a need to know the information even if the activities disclosed are perfectly legal under current law. Uh, and again, I go back to the example, should we know what our military is doing overseas? Uh, again, it might be authorized by um, uh, you know, some secret congressional committee, but we should still know what they're doing. Second, um, I think he's missed the overall thrust um, of the reporting. What, what he hasn't seen uh, is that it tells a story uh, of spy agencies, including the GCHQ and the NSA, systematically undermining uh, the security of our communication systems in order to enable a kind of mass surveillance that has not been shown to be effective. Uh, and there's no way to show that story without broadening the lens uh, to the rest of the world. And indeed, the whole point of it um, is to show that all countries um, you know, are, are gaining these capabilities and that the only way uh, to resolve this problem is either um, through some kind of international legal process where we decide together to constrain it, or on the technical side, uh, to increase end-to-end -end encryption so that no countries uh, are able to, to, to do these kinds of cyber attacks. And so I think, again, um, Fred Kaplan is either willfully misunderstanding that message uh, or he just doesn't understand it. <laughs> Um, I, in, in addition to agreeing with, with Ben, I mean, I would say a, a number of things. I mean, recently, actually, the, the UK, um, uh, that's very secretive court there, found that the, that the uh, surveillance that was happening was illegal because it wasn't actually um, be, be, being done in a way that was, was transparent. In terms of the particular reporting, I mean, there, the stories are so, I mean, there, there is so much information in these documents that talk about targeting people who are suspected of nothing. I mean, what, some of the reporting that I've done the most on it in, in Germany is, is the targeting of engineers who work at telecoms. And they, the GCHQ or the NSA infects their computers with malicious software so they can get their t keystrokes. And once they get their keystrokes, they get into the system. And so we've seen this in, in Belgium that's happened. And we have this, the, the malware that we're now calling um, Reagan or Regan that's been discovered. And that it's, it's, it's going throughout entire systems of, so it's mass surveillance of entire networks. And, and I think that that's, I have, I mean, that's reporting that I think is absolutely in the public interest. And, and I think that it's, you know, the, the, res the international response to the disclosures are testimony. It, it was striking to me in the film how much Snowden wanted to rely on you and Glenn Greenwald to use your journalistic but, judgment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to decide what the public would see rather than him decide. Right, but I don't, think that's, I don't think that's unusual. What I think is unusual is that you get to see it happening. Because I think that if you talk to any journalist, those kinds of, you know, it's, it's not a, a source entrusts a journalist. They build uh, some sort of uh, relationship over time, and then it's up to the journalist and that whatever editorial process that, that they have to decide what to publish. What actually was very unique for me is that, that Snowden, in this case, made the decision that he wasn't going to conceal his identity, and therefore we could see the sort of what happens behind the scenes. But that's, I think, what happens, you know, what you, that's what journalism looks like. Another question? Uh, yeah, I think it's me. Uh, uh, Craig Aaron from Free Press. Um, first of all, really incredibly powerful and amazing film, so thank, thank you for that. Uh, there's a scene that Ben is in where, where he talks about it being, you know, 5% the law and 95% politics. And I think that's probably about right. Um, and because of that, I, I, I fear a little bit that we've let Snowden down uh, with all he put on the line. And our maybe, there, we've made a lot of progress, a lot more awareness, sympathy for what he did. The, the public opinion polls shifted. But real, any kind of thus far lasting political reform, policy reform, uh, hasn't yet succeeded. Um, so I'm wondering from where you sit, what, what your take on is that, that may be too, too pessimistic a take, um, but what you see going around the country with the film, uh, talking about it, do you feel those winds continuing to shift as we approach the second anniversary? Do you see opportunities for that kind of meaningful and uh, lasting reform and, and how fleeting are those opportunities? I, I mean, I think that the changes that we've seen, I mean, I think that there's been a change of consciousness about what about about these technologies and their capability and awareness. So I think that that is an enormous shift 
that, that, we, that didn't exist. I mean, the people who were saying these kinds of things two years ago were considered paranoid. And now we actually know that the government is doing it. I mean, we have documents. I republished a document from the NSA that says we're now living in the golden age of signals intelligence. Like, this is the golden age. I mean, they're very happy about the state of affairs w when it was all happening, you know, in, in secret. Um, so, so I think we have that shift. But in terms of policy, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed in the, the lack of um, change in, in, that, in that arena. Can I respond to this question, too? I, 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 think, I think we need to look at different tracks of reform. Um, uh, I, I've said this before, so it isn't a secret. The first conversation I had with um, Snowden was in July of 2013. So he had already gone from Hong Kong to Russia. Uh, and one of the very first questions he asked me was, do you have standing now? Um, meaning, are you now able to go in court and have your cases heard rather than thrown out on state secrecy grounds like you saw um, in the film? He was very focused uh, on how those uh, existing channels um, had been closed before. And the truth is we now have three cases pending in the courts of appeals in the Second Circuit and the D.C. Circuit and the Ninth Circuit um, that challenge um, the very first revelation um, that the NSA is collecting on a daily basis uh, all of our telephone metadata. Uh, and those cases are being heard on the merits for the very, very first time. Uh, that in itself is an extraordinary change um, that courts are fulfilling their constitutional duty. Congress, um, we will see what happens with Congress, but as you know, um, in May, the, the Patriot Act authority under which the government is collecting all phone records expires. Um, so either there's going to be some renewal with some kind of reform, or they're going to lose that authority. It's a great opportunity for advocates and activists. And finally, um, there's a whole separate reform conversation that's going on in the technology community. Many of those people are represented here. Um, but, but, um, but look at what we've seen in the last few months with the director of the FBI and the British Prime Minister standing up and attacking the most powerful technology companies in the world um, for offering products that are too secure. Uh, that are making law and making surveillance more difficult. Before Snowden, um, we had programs like PRISM operating without public scrutiny, where, where, where the big companies um, and you know, the, the NSA and GCHQ were cooperating quietly. Now those institutions are adverse to each other, and I think that's a real opportunity um, that didn't exist before. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm look, uh, uh, if people think that they have to be better activists because they owe it to Snowden, I applaud that sentiment. <laughs> yeah. What about the private companies themselves? Even if you win every Fourth Amendment claim, and even if Congress makes reforms or the executive branch makes reforms, you still have all these private tech companies collecting every keystroke, collecting every phone at the level of metadata at least. Um, do you think that something needs to be done in your ideal world to, to regulate them um, even if they start resisting the government instead of reflexively cooperating? Well, sure. I mean, first of all, the problems are not so easy to separate entirely because even if the government weren't able to collect any information itself, uh, unless there are strong rules um, governing how they get information from tech agencies, they'll still have everything they want because Facebook and Google have more information than any FBI director uh, ever had. So we do need to focus on what the legal standards are for the government getting information from tech companies. Uh, in, in almost all instances, they should be going to a judge and getting a warrant to do that um, rather than you know, making a phone call or, or even logging into a system um, to do it. But look, I think these are different threats. Um, um, I have a lot of concerns about the power of technology companies. I'm not worried about them um, firing lethal drones at me, um, locking me or someone else up in Guantanamo, doing the kinds of coercive things that governments are able to do. At the same time, um, uh, I talked a minute ago about uh, you know, adversity and separation of powers. Uh, as much as I want to see the technology companies uh, protecting us from the NSA, um, I think only governments uh, are going to be able to protect us as consumers from those technology companies. I'd like to see the Federal Trade Commission and the FCC um, be more aggressive in protecting us as consumers from those tech companies. And again, I don't think those are inconsistent positions. Laura, you have a room full of very interested foundation leaders here <laughs> and a strong set of principles unveiled this morning. How would you like to see philanthropy use funding or other clout to reinforce the values you're for. Well, I mean, actually, this, I did a short talk this morning about precisely that, that all the reporting that I've done has been done using tools that provide privacy and encryption um, that, are, that are created by the free software community that is 
profoundly underfunded and has been doing work to preserve privacy, not to make money, but to um, benefit society. And they've been doing that for for decades, and, and I think that as foundations are considering how they're going to respond to these shifts in technology, they need to bring in this community because this community has, has, it has a level of knowledge that I think that, that, is, that is lacking, and I think that, that it's not the role of, of foundations to, to fund startups, but actually to fund projects that are leading towards you know, so, social justice and, and change. Ben, how would you add to that? I really worry about <coughs> the asymmetry of expertise between the powerful entities that are collecting and aggregating information, um, either because they're spy agencies or because they're corporations, um, and those entities in government and out um, that are trying to, to regulate that, trying to protect people from the consequences of it. Um, uh, if you look at the, the overwhelming majority of, of engineers are either going <coughs> to Silicon Valley or they're going to the you know, surveillance industrial complex, which is not just the NSA, it's all the many, many contractors, like the kinds that, that Ed Snowden worked for. Uh, and you see very, very few of them, although that's beginning to change um, in civil society, in the government regulatory agencies that are trying to, to police um, the, the, the big corporations on congressional committees that have oversight. Um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court doesn't have a full-time technologist. And so how are they, when they hear only from the government, um, supposed to know um, what the NSA is actually going to do. So, so we need to address, um, uh, you know, in some sense we have the challenge of, you know, creating this entire new career um, of public interest um, technologists um, who can, can help, um, you know, those of us who are worried about this fight back on a more even playing field. I just got a sign that said last question. So I will interpret that to mean that I'm now going to ask my last question rather than, <laughs> dude, that was your last question. <laughs> so my last question for you, Ben, is do you see the 2016 presidential election as likely to engage this issue on any meaningful basis? And is Rand Paul actually your biggest ally in the whole field? Well, <laughs> It's, it's, it's a fair question. I mean, I, I, if you say my ally, um, I'm a more complicated actor than just someone who cares about these issues. And I care about a whole range of civil rights and human rights um, issues. And I work for um, a nonpartisan organization. So, um, so rather than, <laughs> than engage that directly, I will say that, that it is a good thing for our democracy to have people running for president um, who don't have establishment, deep state, conventional views about the surveillance state. And if Rand Paul uh, is able to inject some of these ideas um, into a presidential election, that can only be a good thing. And my last question for you, if you win the best Oscar documentary, uh, best documentary Oscar, will that help the cause in any tangible way? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, honestly, I mean, it's very, it's, as a filmmaker, I mean, I, when I was nominated before, it was about the war in Iraq, and I was in Hollywood and, and reading the paper, and it was one of the most violent periods that was happening. And so it's a very, it's a very schizophrenic thing, because of course it's great, you know, but then there are real world issues that are still at stake that don't go away. And, um, and so, yeah, the, the, the acknowledgement of the film certainly will bring more people to pay attention to it, and so that's a good thing. Please thank Laura Poitras and Ben Weisman. <laughs> You've been watching a discussion I moderated on February 11th at the Ford Foundation with Laura Poitras, who made the Oscar-winning documentary Citizen Four about Edward Snowden. Obviously, uh, that was before the Oscar was announced. Also on stage was Snowden's ACLU lawyer, Ben Wisner. Now let's raise a further question. Does all this intelligence gathering actually prevent terrorism? The effectiveness of the program has become suspect after some big claims were later dismantled. In the initial aftermath of the Snowden revelations, NSA Chief General Keith Alexander, as well as President Obama, cited 50-plus terror plots thwarted by the surveillance program. But Alexander later admitted this was way exaggerated and only one successful case has been revealed. Here to discuss the track record of the NSA metadata surveillance program and its one known success story is journalist Mattathias Schwartz. His article, The Whole Haystack, appeared in the January 26th issue of The New Yorker. Welcome. Hi, Brian. 
first of all, did you watch the Arctic, the, the Oscars? Do you think it matters to uh, word getting out about this whole you know, area of, of policy that Laura Poitras won? Uh, I, I watched the Oscars over my phone through Twitter, so I just kind of got the second order reaction. I think probably the, the greatest direct consequence will be that, that more people will see the movie. I don't think it's actually been in such wide release so far. I know it only, like I have friends in Philadelphia, only came there a couple weeks ago and was in a couple theaters, so maybe maybe some people will actually see it now. I mean, I, I, I saw it. And it's in an HBO run now, oh, so right, it's right, also right, right. on TV. Glenn Greenwald was on the stage uh, with Laura Poitras at the Oscars. I saw one of his tweets thanking Lindsay Mills, Snowden's girlfriend, who was also on the stage there. She's free to come and go, even though Snowden isn't. And that Greenwald tweet got hundreds of retweets. Um, so word is getting out, at least to some degree, additionally, because of the movie Citizen Four. So tell us about this 50 versus 1 estimate. Uh, President Obama said 50 plus. The head of the NSA, Alexander, said 54 precise number, and it turns out to be one confirmed case where this metadata collection, looking at all the phone numbers that call all the phone numbers and where we go on the web and stuff like that without our names attached, um, one instance of leading to a terror suspect? Well, the, the, the program we're talking about is the, the, it's called the Section 215 program, and that's Section 215 of the Patriot Act. What it lets the government do is collect metadata for most every phone call made domestically in the United States. So even if a U.S. person is calling a U.S. person and the, the phone call never leaves the border, uh, a log of data containing the number dialed from, the number dialed to, the amount of time the call was, and um, trunk identifier data, uh, which can help pinpoint the location to some degree, almost all of that gets collected for almost every single phone call made domestically in the U.S. It's been going on for about 13 years. So that's what we're talking about with Section 215. So that's domestic. Yeah. So yeah. when um, the president or whoever supports the NSA surveillance program says... And that was if, a, it was the very first thing revealed by Snowden. And his very first disclosure was a FISA court order saying, Verizon, give us all the phone records on right. an ongoing basis. On, and no one knew that this was happening before then, uh, uh, right. outside the government. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. On all yeah. these cell phone yeah. calls in the United States. And right? Cell phones, landlines, all phones. And a, uh, yeah. And, and as Snowden said, and as the movie said, you're saying a, a court actually approved this metadata program. Yeah, this is, this is the, 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 the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court, uh, which does not actually uh, publish any of its findings to the public, or if it only does so on a very limited basis. They've been doing a little bit more so now since the Snowden disclosures. So, yeah, it's a, it's a secret court that issues surveillance orders, and they're the ones that, that interpreted Section 215 uh, which allows the FBI to gather uh, anything that's, that's relevant uh, to an ongoing terrorism investigation. And, and the court deemed that every a single metadata record uh, generated by Verizon domestically can be considered relevant, right. um, even though that it, it's not even clear that any particular terrorism investigation w w was specified. And there's a lot of legal arguments in white papers about how, how relevance doesn't rule anything out, but, but it, it is a pretty elastic definition of wh what you or not, how you or I might use the word, I think. So yeah. where do these numbers 54 and 1 come from? So, so immediately after this program came out, uh, the intelligence community, I, 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 led by the NSA, put together a list of uh, terrorism investigations where they believed Section 215 or perhaps another program, Section 702, uh, had made a contribution. Uh, but then in speeches and in rhetoric, and particularly speech made by President Obama in Berlin, uh, they, uh, it, they began to say that Section 215, they said pretty clearly um, that, uh, that Section 215 had prevented more than 50 terrorist plots. Uh, and then uh, this data began to be sifted and questioned. First, by Senator Patrick Leahy uh, of the Senate Judiciary Committee, started questioning Alexander uh, and his deputy, John Inglis, about the 54 number. And then these cases started to get sifted and examined and analyzed by a government agency called the PCLOB, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. And, and then they issued a report uh, eventually saying that there was actually only one case, in fact, where uh, the Section 215 program had directly demonstrably led to the identification of an unknown terrorism suspect. Perhaps it had been useful in other cases. Perhaps it had helped divert resources away from situations where it could be determined that there was no nexus to terrorism. But there was only one case where it actually 
uh, let the government know that, okay, here's a terrorist that, that, that you didn't know about before, and, and that guy wound up getting convicted. And that we'll only get, happened once. And we'll get into that case yeah. in a minute. But do you conclude from this that General Alexander, head of the NSA, lied to the American people by an order of 54 times? I, I don't know if, if lie is the right word. Uh, I don't think the NSA is an agency that's evolved in a way that it's, it, it's not used to engaging with the public. It's not used to candor. It's not used to this kind of scrutiny. It was completely taken aback by the Snowden disclosures. But, but I do think that what was said initially um, and, and, and what was later demonstrated to be true, there is a really wide gap there that, that is disturbing, especially when you have the president saying it. That's very different because yes. you do expect that the president's speechwriters or advisors, at least, are going to yes. drill down a little bit and right. see, see if this stuff holds Before water. Before they put it in his yeah. mouth. And one thing that Citizen Four does is it does show very clearly General Alexander lying to Congress in denying even the existence of a Section 215 vast metadata collection program um, which then turned out that well, he's, he's definitely he's definitely saying things that that, that are that are ways away from the facts. I don't I don't you know line is a, is a very strong word. And one thing you know, I interviewed Alex, General Alexander in person for this story, and and everyone involved with these programs is extremely in earnest, and they believe they're 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 following the law, and um, they're also under a lot of pressure because if anything ever does happen, then then they really get grilled by right. Congress if there right. ever is a terrorist attack. So they're kind of between a, a rock and a hard place. So so I don't I don't think it's so much uh, you know Machiavellian individuals trying to pull the wool over the eyes as um, as a, a Congress and to some extent the American people that that want to have it both ways and don't want to make these hard choices. So this one known case, a Somali American, uh, Basali Moalan, what were the key charges and how did metadata find him? So uh, the the Let's start with how to define him. Uh, Basali Mawalan was a U.S. citizen born in Somalia, living in San Diego, driving a taxi cab. And the NSA determined that his phone number was an indirect contact with a phone number in Somalia uh, that, that, that was associated with Al Qaeda. And then they let the FBI. That's not a domestic call. Uh, it's actually unclear whether it, it's a domestic call or not. I mean, it would have had to have been a domestic call okay. to be connected to Section 215. Okay, right. But the point you're making is important, and it's a point that Senator Ron Wyden's made, which is we actually could have gotten this guy without Section 215 because uh, he was making overseas phone calls. Right. And so the real number here is not one, it's actually zero. Uh, and and that, that's what Senator Wyden's saying, and, and I think there's a strong case there, and there's a quote in the piece with him saying essentially that. But, but what, what was Basali Moalan doing? That, and, and, uh, was it like a terrorist plot? And, and it wasn't, at least not in the way that word's used, which, which is intended to call 9-11 you know, to mind. Uh, what he was doing was several orders of magnitude lesser. He was collecting money to send to a contact in Somalia who prosecutors uh, demonstrated to a jury, which found him guilty, was connected to al-Shabaab. Uh, but, but none of it was to commit any terrorist act within the United States that was never even discussed uh, on, the, on, on the phone calls. The very group that's now threatening U.S. shopping malls. Al Shabaab. Yeah, you're right. There's a, there's a video on the internet with someone in a mask saying that he's part of Al Shabaab, saying that someone should do this. You're but right. you said not just unnecessary, but counterproductive could be. Uh, yeah, uh, th that's something. That's an argument that, that that some people have made, which is that if you look at most every, and I, I make it in the piece, that uh, if you look at most every terrorist attack committed on U.S. soil uh, or on Western soil, including the Charlie Hebdo attacks, they're committed by uh, perpetrators who law enforcement is already aware of. Is, is potential terrorists. They're not committed by unknown people out there who we need to collect data on to know about. So the, the, I, one could ask the question, and many have, if we can't even keep track of the pool of likely terrorists who we're already aware of, and if they're committing terrorist attack after terrorist attack after terrorist attack, why are, are we collecting all this data against unknown targets and, and, and causing a, a, a good number of false alarms to start ringing when, when we're already stretched thin just, just dealing mm -hmm. with the people we know about? In the event, I asked Laura Poitras and, and Ben Weisner if Obama has done anything since the Snowden revelations uh, to reform, and they basically said no, not at all. If anything has gone in the opposite direction to help formally legitimize these things. Um, but there has been a presidential commission studying the questions, and I think some other study groups too. Has anything changed as a result of Edward Snowden? There have been a series of groups and reports. There's been an order from the president on the Section 215 program that the number of hops that the NSA can go from a contact along the social network has been reduced from three to two. 
although that's just I, I, my understanding is that's a presidential order. Hops, be, meaning, yeah, meaning uh, degrees of association. Um, so a friend of a friend of a friend to a friend of a friend. Uh, but but uh, that could be changed back at, at, by any president at any time. And um, uh, at one point, President Obama said he promised to end the Section 215 program uh, as it currently exists. And he's, he certainly hasn't done that. And, and it's really hard to point your finger at anything that he has done. He, he, uh, I believe he endorsed uh, the USA Freedom Act, which, which would have tempered the NSA's power somewhat. But, but that failed to make it uh, through Congress um, before um, before the the changeover with the w w around the holidays, so and, no, he, he's done he's done very little. I would agree with him. And am I right that Loretta Lynch, his attorney general nominee, uh, was asked at her confirmation hearing whether she considers these NSA programs constitutional, and she basically said yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, no, no, and it's uh, it, 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 it's it, politically it's very hard for anyone to to push back against this because. Uh, they're, they're, again, very linked in people's minds to preventing terrorist attacks, although it's very hard to find any empirical data to support that claim. Um, viewers, if you want to see our guest um, discuss these issues in person, there is an event uh, this coming Monday at um, NYU at 6.30 p.m. Monday, 6.30. That's at the, uh, the Cantor Film Center, 36 East 8th Street. What's going to happen there? Uh, it'll be a panel discussion with, with Robert Shear, uh, another journalist who has a new book on uh, privacy, data, and, and corporate America. Uh, Ed Felton, a professor of computer science at Princeton, and, and, and a couple other folks as well. Jen Lowe and Helen Nissenbaum, I believe. Mattathias Schwartz, our guest, and others. Monday, 6.30 p.m., the Cantor Film Center of NYU, East 8th Street, on Monday, 6.30. Thank you very Great. much Thank for you, joining Brian. us. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure. Up next, civilian drones. Are they a danger to privacy and public safety, or has Washington already overregulated them, stifling innovation? We continue our exploration of privacy and freedom. Drones, they're not just weapons of war or government surveillance. The reach of civilian drones became clear last month when a Phantom II quadcopter manufactured by the Chinese company DJI crash landed on the White House lawn. The devices, hovering precariously overhead, shooting video at close range, are forcing us to rethink air safety and privacy. Since the White House mishap, the government has been quick to respond. Last week, President Obama issued an executive order on governmental drone use. The Federal Aviation Administration responded with a set of rules limiting commercial use. Has Washington got it right? or has it gone too far? Joining us via Skype, the co-director of the University of Washington Tech Policy Lab, Ryan Kahlo. Thank you very much for coming on with us. Hello from New York. Hello, thanks for having me. First, what do you take as the significance, what should be the significance of the incident at the White House? I think it's a reminder that as with uh, all new technologies, all emerging technologies, um, you know, people can use them in ways that are dangerous and stupid. Um, and I think that uh, drones would be the exceptional technology if some people didn't misuse them. My original reaction to hearing that story that a private drone had landed on White House grounds was that it was some kind of a protest against the use of military drones. But you think it was just an accident, right? Yeah, we're, we're pretty certain from the reporting that it was just an accident. Um, you know, and, and it's not the first time that um, something has landed on the White House lawn. I mean, an airplane has landed on the White House lawn. Um, you know, I think in this case it was um, apparently an intelligence officer who was screwing around and, and, uh, and crash landed this, this drone device there. But as you say, it's true that people tend to associate the word drone with the theater of war. Um, and that's one of the reasons that um, the technology is so salient and so visceral in the popular imagination. Am I right that the FAA has now banned automatic drone delivery, like the kind of thing that Amazon had talked about wanting to do to deliver packages to your house? Uh, Brian, I think it would be more accurate to say that they're still banning it. Um, and so the FAA has taken a rare step here in that they've taken a technology that is pretty widely available and as a default said people can't use it. Um, with exceptions, right? And so the defaults, you can't use it. The exceptions are, well, you can use it if you're a hobbyist, 
Um, you can use it if you get a special certificate of authorization from us and so forth. Um, so recently, uh, the FAA has proposed some rules that would relax the ban on the use of drones for a commercial purpose. But I and others have speculated that this will not include drone delivery. And I think that Amazon and, uh, and perhaps Google, although I don't, of course, I don't speak in any way for the companies, I'd imagine they're disappointed with the rules as they're proposed by the FAA right now. Are you disappointed? Do you think there is any rational response to the proliferation of this technology that would allow drones sort of everywhere delivering packages to, you know, apartment 18W and another one to apartment 6M and et cetera, et cetera? Well, I'll, I'll say this. So I, I think there should be a path. There should be a clear um, pathway to creating drones that can safely deliver goods and do other really interesting things autonomously. Um, and so I'd say that the two quibbles, are, and there are more than that, the two concerns I have about the FAA's rules as proposed, and these are not, not the final rules yet, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're going to uh, find out what those are eventually. But as proposed is, number one, they don't make any provisions around privacy. And as you alluded to at the top of your broadcast, um, the president has talked about the use by the federal government of drones, but that doesn't speak to the privacy interests of consumers and citizens as against private use of drones. So that's one thing I think the FAA should think about. And the second is there ought to be a path for an Amazon or a Google to show that just as they can drive cars around that are driverless safely, so can they deliver goods. And right now there really isn't a pathway uh, under, the, under the rules as proposed that would let them get there. Wait, they're not driving driverless vehicles around the roads to deliver <laughs> packages, right? Did I miss something? No, fair enough. But of course, the state of Nevada and other states um, have created a path to test out driverless cars, which could, among other things, deliver goods, but could just move people around. The point is, is that if we can trust companies to take two-ton uh, machines and have them drive themselves um, and at least test that out as a prospect, then we ought to, um, just because something is in the air, uh, doesn't mean that we shouldn't let people uh, experiment um, safely, of course, person within boundaries and with standards, but experiment in doing things like delivering goods. Mind you, you know, these are not two-ton machines. These are very light machines, and, and by and large. Um, and although they, of course, can cause problems, um, you know, there ought to be, again, a way for Amazon to get what it, what it needs to do here or Google. So what about privacy? These very light machines can carry very tiny cameras that can look on, upon you for, you know, the interests of your spouse or the interest of your business or the interests of your government. Um, how much of a concern is that? You raised it. Well, I think that, that privacy and civil liberties is a, is a large concern. Um, and I think it's both a concern because of the way that drones uh, drive down the cost of surveillance to worry to worry worrisome levels. Um, you know, it used to you know officers and, and law enforcement can do lots of the kinds of things they can do with drones already uh, by getting a helicopter or a plane, uh, by following someone around with a car. It's just really expensive, and so they don't do it as much. But now with drones, that gets to be trivially easy, and so I think that because um, you know we ought to have safeguards in place for civil liberties. It's also true, of course, that if Amazon's flying drones along, around your neighborhood, those drones are very likely to have cameras on them, and they're going to capture a lot of activity that may or may not be relevant to drone delivery. Um, and there should be safeguards in place, as there are in general um, with technologies. What's so, an example uh, of a safeguard that would work? How, how would you regulate that? I mean, so uh, various smart people have proposed, th in, in, you know, smart things. So, so the um, EPIC, which is the Electronic Privacy Information Center, I'm on their advisory uh, committee, uh, they propose that when you go to the FAA to seek a license, not only should you show that your use is safe um, and that you have a qualified person flying the drone and so forth, that you should put together a, a privacy impact assessment, a plan. Um, just in the same way that, say, an Internet company has to have a privacy policy. And then the FAA or whomever can keep you to that plan. And I think that's, that's a pretty wise way to go about it. Um, really what I hope is that the courts, um, whether it's uh, interpreting the Constitution in the United States, which applies to, the, um, to law enforcement, or it's interpreting the common law, like torts, where you know, people sue each other for reasons other than contract, that they should um, recognize 
that flying over someone's yard to spy on them could be an intrusion upon their seclusion. And this is a you know old common law tort uh, that if you violate someone else's privacy by intruding into it, you can get compensation. But notoriously, it's very difficult to show as a very high bar to be able to overcome. So whether it's the federal government or the states or the courts, we need to find a way to domesticate the problem of privacy, um, or people are just not going to be comfortable with these with these drones in the air. We tend to think of drones as flying vehicles, but they can also be on the ground. Take a look at this device called a sand flea. Well, it was on the ground and in the air. I think that's how we evolved from the reptiles when they came out of the water onto the land. Uh, are you familiar with the, that device? Who could use that for what? Oh, I think that that device um, uh, it raises a really important point here, which is that what we're talking about is robotics and surveillance technology in general. There's nothing unique, really, about the drone. I mean, I understand it can, it can fly. But lots of technologies have the ability to make it easier to surveil people and consumers. And, and the sand flea, which is a Boston Dynamic robot, Boston Dynamic was purchased by Google, um, it just goes to show that. There are also robots that can climb the side of buildings. Uh, there are robots that are essentially balloons. Uh, there are robots that um, uh, can jump up on top of a building, for instance, or things that you could throw in the air instead of flying. I mean, all of these devices are capable of um, taking pictures or taking video or violating people's um, privacy. So um, sometimes I worry that states and the federal government will expend all of their political capital on getting a drone bill, a, a bill that limits how drones are used. And then the folks who are interested in surveillance and monitoring will just use another technology that doesn't happen to fly like a fixed wing aircraft. Um, and that would not be subject to, to the FAA in most cases. We're entering an election year, a presidential election year. Do you see this in partisan terms at all? Do you think one party or the other is more friendly to experimenting uh, with private drone use in the way that it sounds like you're advocating? You know, not not really. I mean, you know, I, 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 in my experience, um, and I, I got a chance to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee a couple of years ago about the domestic use of drones. And in my experience, um, you know, legislators from both sides um, are concerned about drones and they're concerned about civil liberties. Um, I don't think of this as being a, a really such a partisan issue. I suppose you could say that conservatives. Um, uh, disfavor restrictions on industry more than do liberals. Um, but both sides appear to be concerned about the privacy aspects of, of drones, and which is why I think that whether it's at the federal or state level, um, you know, some movement on this topic is likely. Well, I'm sure as the technology advances and becomes ever more tantalizing, this is hardly the last conversation we'll have about drones in private use in the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And that's our exploration of privacy and security in this high-tech era. We are here each week at this hour, and do tune in to my radio program weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC 93.9 FM and AM 820. Tomorrow, we say goodbye to the TV show Parks and Recreation, which just completed its finale. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.